Look for a major event, I heard the Lord say, to take place in Las Vegas. I see some kind of, I think it's some kind of sickness. An epidemic, maybe. I saw an aircraft disaster, but I saw a missile blow on and pass New York, Siberia, volcano, and I saw a flood in India. The Lord said to us, meet me in the temple at the 11th hour.
had to decide in that very time, in that very hour, yes, what side they would be on when the fight heated up. Where would they actually stand? Would they join the crowds and the masses or would they hold to God's unchanging hand? For we're about to move on, says the Lord. You're about to see new lands and things. For this is the time for you to decide, where do I stand today? Oh, it's time to make up your mind. What side you're on?
choice Make a choice Hear his voice For today is the day to choose Oh, choose you this day Who you will serve stature, men of low stature will make their choice. For now we are crossing and we are crossing headed toward a new land. And this is the time when you will have to decide whether you're going to hold on to the world or God's hand. For you will turn loose of one or the other and you may never reach for the other again. But this is the time, says the Lord of grace, for you to begin. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose you this day out loud. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you be among the three or the rest of the crowd? For the governments and kings of the earth are railing because they're about to lose. And now it's going to come down what you will choose. If you will stand with the Lord, you will win hands down. For you will come out of the fiery smoke with no harm to your gowns. Your hat will be intact. Your shoes, your hose, and your clothes will not even smell. For this is the time, says the Lord, I'm going to part the Jordan as it swells. I will show you great and miracles that you've never seen to this day, that you've never even knew was here. But the Lord says, you're going to have to take my hand and come with me and have no fear, for I'm going to show you how wicked politicians will lose. I'm going to show you how they've set themselves as a God. But this is not their land, says the Lord. This is the land for you to try. I have sent out angels like hornets ahead of you in this time in 2023. For you are going to see, says the Lord, in this year it's going to be you and me. Hallelujah. Fly high, says Stretch out your wings and soar For after 2023 You're going to 2024 in the open door I am going to show you great and mighty things That you knew not even existed Stretch out your faith, says the Lord of grace And I will show you what you resisted For this is the time for you to win and win big, you're going to win like never before. For after 2023 with you and me, you're going through an open door. And things will be easier than they've been. Things will be easier seen. And what you can see, you can enter in. So get ready. 
says the Lord. I hear 
about Texas? Texas with a dry, unchanging wind blowing through once again. I have called upon you to stand against all odds more than one time in history, says the king. I am coming to you one more time to stand. And you must stand this time. And you must sing. Sing what? Victory. Sing the songs of victory. And you wicked politicians that are trying to swerve and turn Texas. You are going to step down or I'm going to drag you down. I'm going to pull you down for your harvest has come. You have set and you have fattened your gullet on meals that have the poor and the downtrodden have prepared for you. And you've ate from their plates like they were nothing, says the Lord. Well, I've sent you word after word after word. Move out of the way. Move out of the way. And you religious leaders that are standing up to kill the unborn, standing up to support porn, standing up to come against all righteous waves, either move or I will move you out of the way. For Texas, now I'm calling on you one more time. Stand this time or remain blind. It is strictly up to you, says the Lord, but your destiny will elude you should you do these things. Stand up. Be a voice. Be counted. I'm speaking to you, Baptist. I'm speaking to you, Methodist. I'm speaking to you, denominational churches that claim to rule the sky. Stand up and be a voice for me. Stand up and say something. Stand up and do something. Or you will find yourself sitting in a puddle and crying. For ever since the Alamo, Texas pointed the way. And I'm calling on them today. New Mexico, yes, New Mexico. It is time for you to right your wrongs. Right your wrongs, for I've carried you on a plate and I've carried you around and shown you grace. But now stand up and right your wrongs. Stand up and sing the right songs. Stand up and get rid of that wicked leader once and for all. Vote them out. Move them about. Vote. Vote, yes. But what if they steal? The Lord said, I will pull their teeth this time. Vote righteousness. Pray for the same. For it is time. Mexico to help lead the way.
my spirit about Louisiana. And the Lord says, Louisiana is standing doing a righteousness for me. He said, Louisiana has a righteous flow in it right now. And for lack of better words, I'm trying to hear the Lord is very proud of Louisiana right now. I've never heard that in my life. In a great way, the Lord is really smiling on Louisiana. Things are changing in Paris. Things are changing in Illinois. Things are changing, says the Lord, in the land of Chips Ahoy. I don't know some of the things you hear, but the Lord says it's changing in the land of the beer. I've raised up righteousness there. And you're going to see a revival. Where? In the long hair. For the time of the prophets have come. The time of prophecies of some. The time of the prophets have come. The eagles in flight. In the night. that means 
wounds spiritually, physically, mentally. But yet again, the time of Peter's have come to weep bitterly and turn your whole heart toward God. For Judas and Peter had the same choice to make. It just seemed too hard for Judas. But you chose to obey. Some of you to obey God and some of you to turn against his call. You could have still pulled out until you sold out the ones I anointed, the ones I've called. The night of Judas has begun. Confusion has now set in in their minds. Political Judases going blind. Hear it? Hear that? It's the sound of Russian ships. It's the sound in the Black Sea. Everything you know is about to change. God's people for the good, you see. says yes Biden was wicked yes but I'm going to tell you something that he's displeased with big that you would take an elderly man and no matter how wicked someone is you would take it cruelly treat them that way put them on display to make a fool out of them and you would abuse them that way. The Lord said three, four handlers now that have done this are finished. You'll see it. You'll see it when it happens. He wasn't pleased with that. Someone says, yes, but Biden was wicked. Yes, everyone knows this. But that does not give excuse for cruelty and brutality to an elderly person and elderly abuse. Especially when he don't even know he's being done this way. And he stands and smiles like everything is right. The Lord is not pleased with you handlers.
Elijah's have hid by the brook Kirath. They've hid and been fed there by the ravens. But they're about to show themselves. Elijah's have been given words to widows, sustaining and helping and moving about covertly while the enemy groped to find them. But they're about to show themselves again on Carmel. It's about to be seen prophets who will stand and tell. It's about to happen, says the Lord. Welcome everybody into the 11th hour today. None of this was planned. No, none of the music was planned. We just came in and started playing and the Lord started doing sounds and frequencies and revealing secrets and, and things like that. So today on the 11th hour, you can already tell it's going to be different. So I want to thank you for tuning in, all of our partners for being here. Uh, I was praying over our partners last night. I'll be praying over you tonight. And um, this is a great time of transition, a great time of victory, and a great time we're going to move on. A lot of things that you think have, have came to stay in this nation and in the world is not going to. Uh, things that, that people think have come to stay, I hear the Lord say, nay. It has not come to stay. And, and ever so often in every generation and so forth, there's always fools that rise up on the scene and think that they have a wiser answer than God. They always, see, you're not in a time where men think they have power. You're in a time when politicians, some of them, think they are gods. 
They really believe they are gods. And some of them are worshiping Satan. Some are in the occult. Some are, are worshiping Baal. And they think they're gods. They're in the position right now of Pharaoh. When the Lord told Pharaoh, he said, you're slated for greatness. Now, I'm just putting this paraphrasing. He said, you're, you're slated for greatness. Uh, uh, you know, you can make, uh, your name will be great in the earth, and you'll make my name great in the earth. And God intended on him to go down, and history is famous for letting his people go and showing them freedom. But he was slated for greatness no matter how that greatness was coming. Pharaoh decided that he was not letting them go, but the greatness he was slated for, he did go down in history as great. The greatest failure and defeated politician that ever fought God. Besides, you know, and, and beside him, there are close seconds. There are, there's Herod who fell down and was eaten of worms from the inside out. That's a uh, because it said the angel of the Lord smote him. And so what in the world did he smote him with? Well, he was eaten of worms from the inside out and fell down and died in front of everybody who thought he was a god. Because they said it's not the voice of a, of a man, it's the voice of a god. And he didn't give God credit. And it said the angel of the Lord smote him, which means he had a harvest that came up to him right there on the spot because he thought he was God. Pharaoh only went into the Red Sea because he thought the Red Sea parted for him, not for Moses, not for the children of Israel. He thought it parted for him. That's the only thing would have made a man in his right, any kind of right mind, go down into that sea after them. And so he went down there thinking the sea had parted for him. But the scripture said, the Lord said, I'll get me honor on Pharaoh. In other words, I'm going to show you who the sea honors, me or Pharaoh. Well, the time of honor has come. And the Lord is about to show the world who the elements honor, who the nations honor. Him are these men who think they're God. So some of these politicians and some of these wicked, perverted fools were absolutely slated for greatness. And so... Greatness will come one way or the other to them. So it would be in your best interest to instead of being like Judas, to be like Peter. There was no difference in the two. Both did the same thing. Peter denied him three times. Judas betrayed him. Both betrayed him. The difference was is Peter had a revelation that he's the Christ. And he wept bitterly and repented. Judas hanged himself. So these people that are slated for greatness, you need to choose today what you're going to do with it. And that could go all the way from the lowest to the highest. For the time of honor has come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we'll be right back. It is good to have you today on the 11th hour. I want to welcome you back in 
this is going to be a strong 11th hour. It's already been a strong 11th hour. You know, sometimes you have to realize that your greatest protection is right in the middle of that fight. What you hide and not hit head on to fight, um, it will find you. And it will find you. Don't, don't, you, in a spiritual fight, you have to hit it head on. Your greatest protection is in doing what God called you to do. In that protection, in that call, he can protect you, perfect you, correct you, direct you. He can do all of these things if you're moving in this call. And governments are not. You know, governments are, are great and wonderful sometimes. Uh, if they follow the Lord, they can, they can protect the rights of God's people, and they can help them. But they're never intended on replacing God. They're only to, to carry out his wishes, his will. And when men lose sight of that and try to become God, there is no depth to the depravity and the evil that they will walk in. On December the 11th, the Lord began to talk to me about something. He said, a battle is ensuing. It is raging as we speak. It is such a covert and yet a monumental battle. The outcome of this one is going to determine empowerment of the enemy to bring to pass Daniel chapter 7. He said, to speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hands until a time and times and dividing of times. Well, this agenda is a global agenda, and it is the enemy's agenda. I think that's somewhere around, what, Daniel 7, verse 25, maybe. We can look in there and see. If it's there, we'll put it up. But this is the battle that's ensuing right now. And I want you to really take heed, 11th Hour family and partners, Take heed to what I'm saying and, and listen to a, a, a spiritual war strategy. It says here that this is four things he's setting out to do, and it always seems to be four, always, because it's the number of establishment. First of all, he's going to speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Now, those two go together to bring about the third. See, he, the enemy starts speaking uh, great words against the Most High. You can hear people right now like uh, Noah Harari. Every time the man opens his ignorant mouth, every time he speaks with the dark tones and the gas of the pytho spirit, Every time he releases that out of his mouth and his breath sucks the air out of the room and begins to release that pythos gas that chokes somebody down, every time he does that, no matter what speech it is, he must mention God every time. Have you not noticed that? Every time he mentions God, he speaks of God. He speaks of the God of the Bible. He speaks of the God of the Hebrew Bible. He has to blaspheme Jesus Christ. He has to say something about God. Now, why on this earth would an ignorant two-bit philosopher, all of a sudden, every time he starts speaking about something, he has to mention God? If science is his God, and if science is all these men and women's God, why would you mention the God of the Bible? Why would you even try to attack the God of the Bible? It's just like atheists come on the scene. We don't believe in God. We don't believe in God and try to prove God wrong. If you're really an atheist and you don't believe in God at all, he would not cross your mind. You wouldn't care. You would just say, oh, they're a bunch of idiots and go on about your business. But the mere fact that you try to prove God doesn't exist is the fact that you believe he's real. You know he's real or you wouldn't talk about it. And there's a demonic spirit present. Who is Harari? Who is Yuval Noah Harari? Who is this clown? Well, you might be surprised. You might be surprised who he is when he sucks the air out of the room. 
and speaks in a way that you think he's intelligent. And he begins to talk. But every conversation is simply to speak words against the Most High. Every single one. And wear out the saints. Now that's what he's doing. Now you got to stay with me. Now just listen to me a few minutes. There was an old movie, and I said this the other day, and I don't, I don't remember everything about it, but I do remember it from years and years ago. I, I guess, uh, I don't know when it was, 90s, 80s. It was a movie called The 13th Warrior. And I remember that. And, and the reason I remember it is because it was all a spiritual thing where these were men they thought were some kind of spirit beings, but they were actually just men. But they were getting their orders from an oracle. See, oracles were something back in the Roman days. They were back in the days of, of paganism. And, and they still are. They have oracles. And in this particular movie, they went down into this cave. They knew they had to kill the oracle or had to get rid of the oracle. Or these things were going to keep attacking. And this oracle would camp out in this cave and hear the pronouncements of the dark side and tell the leaders of the nation. Well, the oracle, you may be surprised who Harari is because they call him the prophet, the prophet. Well, there's only one prophet that blasphemes the most high in the scripture, and he's called the false prophet. People say, yeah, you know, uh, uh, Brother Robin is a, uh, is a false prophet. Well, if you call me that, don't call me brother. <laughs> don't call me brother if you think I'm a false prophet. Do you want to be brother to a false prophet? You need to check your mouth. So don't, don't call me a false prophet when I proclaim Jesus Christ the only way to heaven. His blood is the only answer. He died. He went into hell. He paid the price. He rose again. He became sin for us, rose again, left your sin in hell, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And if you don't make him Lord of your life, you will split hell wide open like a rubber ball bouncing through a fire. Now, is that a false prophet? Well, hell no. Hell would say no. Hell would say no. Wouldn't it? Hell would say no. But when you've got a guy who sits up and says, all the God of the Bible managed to do was create organic life. All the, all the God of the Bible. Let me, say, let me tell you something. Why don't you try straining out your rear end a living plant? Just try that one time. And if you can produce one poppy plant that, that sits out there that you can smoke a bunch of crap and get yourself high, why don't you just produce that out your rump? because you can't do it. Well, you shouldn't get so crude, Brother Robin. Well, they shouldn't put fools out on parade and try to talk against the God of the Bible that created everything that exists. And then you're going to sit up there and talk about how you're smarter than God? Oh, God, that's ignorance gone to seed. That's absolutely, why don't you just vomit on stage? And so here, here we have Oh, Brother Robin, you're just so crude. No, sometimes I'm, I'm rather eloquent. But this is not that day. And so you have people like this. They speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. So the great words they keep speaking and keep speaking and keep speaking is to wear out. Yeah, I know it. I know. See, what happened was is when I began to talk the way I was talking, well, I wouldn't say that. I know it. I wouldn't say that. I know you wouldn't. But I have to believe you would if the Lord told you to. Then I lose most of the religious crowd right there. They are not going to let somebody like me speak that way. 
But it doesn't matter. I was raised up for a time as this, and so were other prophets, and we must speak. We must speak now. And if you think people don't understand just straight, crude talk, you haven't watched any television in a long time. They talk about things that you wouldn't even believe. That's just awful. But he seeks to wear out the saints of the Most High. So these are two attacks in Daniel chapter 7 against the Most High. Look how it says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. Now, if that's not Harari, you tell me who it is. Even Swab don't say that. He just talks about everything he wants to see accomplished, but not Harari. Harari talks about spiritual matters and God. Why? Because he's speaking against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change. Here it is. He does the first two to bring about the third. Think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until time and times and the dividing of times. This is talking about the tribulation. He is, it's alluding to it. It's, it's forecasting it. He's trying to bring about times. He wants to change the times. And it says it'll be given into his hands. What? The saints? No, the times. He seeks to change times and laws. And they, the times and the laws, shall be given into his hands if he can wear out the saints. It's the saints that are standing in resistance against this change. It's the body of Christ. It's the saints. Well, we'll just surround the saints and take them down. You better watch it. They tried to do that in Samuel's day too. He prayed and thunder and hailstones came down out of the sky on the enemy. You better watch it. You better watch it. You're about to unleash uh, plagues of biblical proportion. You're, you're about to call forth uh, uh, things of, of epic biblical magnitudes. You don't want to see that. You've never seen anything like that. When all of a sudden you look outside and say, oh, a bunch of wicked people put on their nice clean suits after they worship Baal half a night and come walking out that next morning, I'm going to my office today. Whoa, and a 60-pound hailstone starts falling out of the sky. I believe I will stay indoors. <laughs> Especially when you look out there and they got your name on them. Yeah. <laughs> well, that sobers people up quick. But here is the thing. He said he seeks to wear out the saints of the Most High. Notice he uses the, the name uh, El Elyon. He uses the name Most High, the Most High, twice. I guess that would be the Hebrew name El Elyon, the Most High God. So he's using the name Most High, Most High. And he said he speaks words against the Most High to wear out the saints of the Most High. That's interesting. Why? Because he's thinking to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand, the times and laws, until a time and times and the dividing of time, when he's able to wear out the saints. He may not wear out the saints in this time. He may not. We do not give him permission, access denied. He's not wearing out the saints this time. And we are the victorious church. Every Every generation has an opportunity to bring the king back and be the victorious church over the Antichrist spirit. In World War II, Hitler had an opportunity to be the Antichrist. That's why he was searching for the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Articles. He really thought he was going to reign and rule in this life, but he ended up just being dead in a hole in the ground somewhere. And now, and now he lost because saints in his day would not be worn out. They stayed on their faces. Intercessors prayed night and day. They prayed. You know, the Japanese empire decided to rule the world, but saints prayed them out. I'm, not ta I'm talking about governments now. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about wicked governments. Everybody in Germany, you know, wasn't a Nazi. 
but everybody was being controlled by them. And so they come on the scene. Well, there's people right now in China that are rising up against Xi. They want to say they're rising up against Xi in resistance, calling for him to come down. Nobody's ever seen that before. Nobody. So God has people, and his people are everywhere. Now listen to this close. So in this time... He's seeking to speak great words, to speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. The problem is, is we won't be worn out in this time. I said worn. In Alabama, we usually say we won't be wore out. But worn, we won't be worn out. Now, because he wants to bring in his control of time, times, and the dividing of times. And the great tribulation is three and a half years. He's trying to push this thing into being. Now, the first two go together to bring about the third. And if the third comes about, the times and laws will be given into his hands. If the third part can come about. Now, I want you, if the saints can be worn out. Now, I want you to go over to Revelation 6. And I want to show you something I haven't said before and uh, I knew when the Lord spoke this to me the other day it was all I could do to keep from just telling it everywhere now we're going to put up verse 1 and we'll just start there and we're going to come down through there now it says and I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder one of the four beasts saying Come and see. Now, I'm going to have to talk about a mystery here that a lot of people never see. And the mystery is simply this. Uh, well, there is no simple mystery. You know, mysteries, well, I'll talk about that maybe in a minute. But, but this mystery I'm speaking of here is called impressions in the dust. See, when God created Adam, he made an image of the man in the dirt before the man arrived, before the spirit of the man came. The spirit is the real man. The body was made from dust or dirt. And so there was an image of the event before the event came, and that set a precedent because he, God didn't just water the place where Adam's body was made. The Scripture said he watered the whole face of the ground. In other words, the whole earth was under this new commandment, this precedent, that there would always be an image of an event before the event actually arrives so that the earth can be warned of its coming, can see it coming, can know it's coming, and can do what's necessary to either prevent it or, or cause it. And so there's always an image of it so that the creation is not caught off guard. And so there was an image of the man's body before God brought the spirit of the man to the body. Well, it's the same way with everything. The events of 9-11 in September uh, 2001 was all about, it was an image of, of Revelation 18 and so forth, of, the, of Babylon the Great falling, falling. It was almost the same thing. And even the trade center, everything, it wasn't the event. It was an image of something coming. And so you even heard, uh, I think it was, or you even heard Giuliani say, what cities like this great city? Well, that's exactly what was quoted in those scriptures. So it was an event, an image of an event that was coming. It was called an impression in the earth. Well, the same thing happens on everything coming. And sometimes the, the bodies of the events that are created look so much like the event that you will swear you're in the middle of that event. See, we would have thought we were in the middle of the tribulation in Revelation 18 and 19 when the Twin Towers did what they did and all that, we would have thought we were in that except the water didn't turn to blood. There was, no, there was just things wasn't happening. 
but it looked so much like it that people said we're in it. Well, it's the same thing in Revelation 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now notice this. This is after Revelation 4, when a door opened in heaven and a voice was heard as a trumpet saying, Come up hither. Well, this happened afterward. So we know this is later, after we go through a door in Revelation 4. So here we are later, and it says a white horse and a crown. Well, now notice this. The white horse, it looks righteous, but it actually means dead white, like a, a person who's died and just turned white. All right? So we see that it's going to, a horse is going to ride death. And it says he had a, had a bow in his hand and he had a crown, the one sitting on the horse, a crown was given to him. And with this bow and with this crown, he went forth conquering and to conquer. Well, what is that? Well, when you understand the word bow, one of the translations is actually, a poison dart. A poison dart. And the word crown is corona and a poison dart. Now think about that. So he goes forth conquering and to conquer with this. Well, we say, well, that was, that was it, wasn't it? That was it. That was the trick. No, no, no. It was an image of what's coming. Now you know how it's coming, and everybody will be able to recognize it when that day arrives. And they put stuff over your face, and you couldn't buy or sell without it, and you, it was just like it. So then look at the next one. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. It's something for you to come and see. He wanted him to see it. And he said here, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Oh, wait a minute. A red horse. A red horse. We saw not long ago that began to show up. A blood red or a fiery red, actually the Greek would say, horse. And it said it was given unto the one setting on him to take peace from the earth and they should kill one another. And then suddenly we see right after the poison dart, the crown, then the Ukraine broke out trying to draw the world into a war. Not just the Ukraine. Not just Russia, the world, trying to create a world war, the red horse. What is that? That's a tribulation. No, it's an image of something. Then it says, when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So now famine. Famine started. And, and now you know what happened when that ship got stuck in the Suez. If all of those ships that had been backed up in the Red Sea had have been forced to go around the Horn of Africa, it was going to create such a worldwide crisis of shortages that the world would have spiraled into such a world global famine. They're trying to do it now. 
And when the, but the Lord said, I'll show you a miracle in a ship. He used this prophetic voice to tell that. And that ship broke loose, and, they, and all of a sudden they couldn't do it. So they backed up 300 ships off the coast of California, tried to create another one. They've tried to create it, create it, create it, but they're having a real hard time in a land that God has blessed. But they want to create a worldwide shortage. So in Holland and places like that, they're, they're doing this nitrogen thing where they're causing the farmers to have to kill their cattle. Just so that, and, and they don't have enough food and they're trying to isolate. And if you want to know what's happening, they're trying to do what Harari said. Create a serf and slave constitution for the new world. This is what he said. He said, if you don't get on board, they won't need you as a serf or a slave. So they're already drawn this constitution up. So you see that. Then he comes down here and it says, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse. And his name that was on him was death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him, listen to this, over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. He said, a pale horse. Whoa. Pale doesn't mean bleached white. It actually means green, a green horse. And on this green horse, the guy that rode him, his name was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto the horse and the rider over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. And I, and I always thought, and it still could be, because the scripture is so vast, that it was Islam, the color of green, but on this rider, it doesn't actually talk like that. It says it was a green horse. And his name that said on him was Death. And then it, the Lord began to show me. He was proclaimed when they first started saying the new green deal. The new deal. The new green deal. And then suddenly we have a summit meeting on Sinai at the Red Sea Resort, uh, on the Red Sea Resort, and on Sinai where all these global leaders came together and rewrote the Ten Commandments. Listen, the new green Ten Commandments. They wrote Ten Green, they call it Commandments. Green. And it was world leaders. Even the Catholic Church send, sent an ambassador to represent them. And all of these pagans, it said, pagans and Christians came together to apologize for harming the planet. And they wrote 10 green commandments. And then a Jewish man goes up the mountain and he comes back with the tablets. Listen. Green tablets. They were green. Not just written for the green. They were green. And he came back down and broke them. And it says here, death rides that horse. And hell follows that horse. And power was given unto them over the fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, war, and with hunger, shortages, and with death, and with the beast of the earth, the green, everything to preserve this new thing. And guess who shows up to speak at their thing? Klaus Schwab. Their boss shows up. And they're talking. This is the impression of the green horse. How, how, can anybody see that? 
That's the impression of it. They even made the green tablets and broke them. And it said death rides that horse and hell follows that horse. And they create shortages because of that horse. And they'll create wars over that horse. And the rider and the horse create wars and starvation and all kinds of things to preserve their new green. This is why somebody that's a total, absolutely unqualified, almost airheads get in Congress like the squad, they call them. And you can tell they have no more sense to run a Girl Scout camp than they do running a nation. And they get on there and they start talking about this trillions of dollars worth of their new green stuff. And yet, supposedly intelligent people jump on board and support them in it. And now we have hundreds of, of people representing nations on Sinai and at the Red Sea riding new green commandments. It's the pale horse. So right now, they have the poison dart and the crown. They have the, the war in Ukraine trying to draw the world into a world war. They're creating shortages and famines. And now, suddenly, we have a pale horse that shows up. Yeah, well, it looks like we're in the tribulation to me, Brother Robin. No, we're the impressions of it. Now you know how they're going to do it. You know how they're going to do it. And if you know how they're going to do it, see, all the time through all of history and all of the creation, ever since there's been, ever since Cain killed Abel and Nimrod came on the scene with his big hunk of self and come out there with his trying to turn himself into some deformed giant, trying to make himself some greatness, building the Tower of Babel and so forth. Ever since then, Satan has always had a man as a king going to conquer. But this is the first time he's ever got all the governments together to accept the man that will come. And it's different this time. And the churches just sit over here drinking their tea. Praise God. Oh, praise God. And they just praise God. And they, they, you can't even tell what they are anymore. They just jump around and, they're, and, and, and they, they don't have any glory. So, dear God, fill the stage with a fog machine so that everybody looks like we're, we're up there and, and doing something. I'm not downing how they worship or what they do, but it's time that we saw the real deal again. Elijah didn't bring out something, a fog machine, and try to create a smoke when the fire fell out of the sky. He just prayed a 63-word prayer, and whoo, man, down it came. We have to get up on that stage, and if you're going to jump high, scream Jesus when you jump and come down telling God's people you can be healed and God will set you free and he'll prosper you and he'll bring you over the top. Don't jump back down there and say, I'm almost drowning in the water and I've got my nose right above, but God's in control. Why don't you land on that stage and start firing off the word of the living God and start speaking power to the people? Real power. What is that a sign of when we don't talk power? What is that a sign of when churches won't preach healing, prosperity, health, deliverance, and won't put a fight back in the people? What is that called? Wearing out. The saints, wearing them out. And the government says, lock up, church. You're unessential. Okay. And just chain the door. Okay. Everything is okay. Somebody show up showing some kind of power. And you see the churches who are worn out say, I don't like them. I don't like them. Why don't you like them? Because they talk too arrogant. No, they talk what your denomination was founded talking. You just forgot it. You just forgot what John Wesley knew. That's all. 
You forgot what John Wesley knew. You forgot the power that slammed a Bible down on a cemetery and on a tombstone and preached and 30,000 got saved. You, you, you forgot the power of the man of God who crawled up in the hollow log and prayed and squirrels brought him food and during the, the great reformation and turn around and had revival like that. You forgot people like Peter Cartwright who grabbed a hold of a, a, a woman's hands in a dance hall and said, I don't dance unless I pray and started praying, and when he opened his eyes, the whole barn had fell out under the power. You forgot things like that because you're worn slam out. You have to start reviving your own heart before you're going to revive a generation. And so you say, well, why don't we talk like that anymore? Because you're worn out. You're worn out. You wouldn't dare resist, you wouldn't resist a sick kangaroo if it was out in your front yard telling you don't leave your house. I doubt you'd bait your own hook. You're supposed to be fishers of men. Well, they don't want what you got. Men don't want what weak churches have. You're fishers of men. Will you bait your hook or are you using artificial lures? Artificial lures. We'll make the lights dance. We'll make the fog run up our pants. We'll make a we'll 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 sit around and make our teeth so capped white and we'll just bounce around and we'll just sing about everything. But when it comes down to laying hands on the sick, I'm gonna do it with my mask on. You have artificial lures you're trying to fish with. They don't nobody want that. Ever drunk in a nightclub tell you they don't want that. I won't see the power again like the guy who was in the nightclub and he was sitting there at the table and the guy walked in and he walked in and sat down. He was all distraught and he sat down and he ordered a beer. He slammed that beer on the table and his friend was sitting over there with his long neck and he said, what is wrong with you, man? He said, I don't know. I don't know. Something happened to me last night. He said, well, what happened to you? He's sitting there with his beer. He said, man, it was bad. I, he said, oh, it was tough. It was, it was big or something. He said, I don't know if I'm quoting him exactly right, but he said, man, it, it was something. He said, well, what is it? He said, okay, here it is. Listen. And the guy said, whoa, hey, man, hey, you got baptized in the Holy Ghost. You better get out of here. <laughs> Where is that kind of power? It don't come with artificial lures. There's something to be said about baiting a hook with a live bait. If people pick up a, an actual worm and have to feed it on a hook. Well, we can't do that because we got the green deal going on. We'll just throw the artificial lures out there. I'm going to tell you something. We're in a war. And you're going to have to really fish for men, not fish for the ones in your denomination that hadn't come in three weeks. You're going to have to fish for men. Where are they? They're in the homosexual community. They're out there in the bars. They're out there in the drug houses. They're all out there, and they're going to have to see something that you have that they don't have. Hallelujah. Oh, Brother Robin, you just being loud and rude today. Yes, I might get ruder. I might get even ruder still. Because now they have four impressions of the Antichrist. Four impressions of these horsemen already in the earth. What is an impression? Okay, okay. Here's an impression. Here's the danger of letting an impression stand. Because the Bible said when Jesus died on the cross, that he said when he died, you know, when Krista was little, she'd preach. You know Jesus died on the cross. You know he died on the cross. She's just a little bitty girl preaching, preaching in nursing homes at six. Think of that. She had saw real her whole life. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he, the Bible said, 
there was a great earthquake. And the rocks rent, the veil was rent, so forth. It said, but the many of the, uh, it said the graves were opened and many of the bodies of the saints arose and went into the holy city and testified. But it don't stop there. It says after his resurrection. After his resurrection. They didn't get up until after he got up. The graves were opened that day, but they didn't get up until he got up because he is the resurrection. The danger of this is, is that they're creating bodies. They're creating bodies and images to be inhabited and yet in the days to come. The problem is, is that if they wear out the saints, they can change the laws and the times and bring the tribulation, to bring that in before it's time and get those bodies up. That's the danger in this thing. But see, as long as there's a resistance, an active, on purpose resistance, he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way then that wicked one will be revealed. In other words, those who are resisting, who is resisting, who will stand resisting, will keep those bodies from getting up until they are taken out of the way. So the enemy, if you let, if weak churches seek to let him have the laws and the times, it's not going to be long they're going to seek to kill off the Christians to get them out of the way so that they can get the bodies up. Did you hear that? Did anybody hear that? So now what do you think was going on in the days of Nero? Go beyond Nero. Go beyond what you think he just did and all the atrocities he did, feeding Christians to lions, hanging them up and using them for his lamps, and he covered them with coal oil and lit them up. Uh, go beyond that. Why was he so bent on killing all the Christians? Because he was a type of the Antichrist. Paul spoke of it when he was on the earth, and he was on the earth at the same time. And he said there's already many Antichrists. But there is one that's coming, and each one of them are trying to be him. And every time the enemy has a force trying to push a man into that position, push him into that position, and so he, the Satan knew, I must kill off the Christians in order to get this body up. Because no, nothing gets up until Jesus gets up. So it's not long if you let him wear you out and you give him the times and the laws, the laws. It's not long before men will start trying to kill off the church. Kill the Christians to get the resistance out of the way so that the bodies can get up. I don't know if anybody caught all that or not. But that's spiritual warfare. That's spiritual warfare into the, almost the lethal position. So they've tried to bring about this the, with the with the virus, the Ukrainian war, the, uh, the shortages, and now the green commandments on Sinai. They've done all of this and tried to do all of this. And, and so the four horsemen in their minds are riding. And Klaus Schwab, you know, he's a good type of the Antichrist, I guess, and they ain't no good type, but Harari, a type of the, of the um, false prophet and so on and so forth. And so on. You can, you can see how that shapes up real quick. Now, I want you to hear this. Politicians should realize that time will not be given back to you. Do you not understand that you will not be given back your time? Some of you will be Show mercy as you called for mercy, but your time will not be given back to you. Do you not understand you would only have time to save yourself? All of this crap you've done, 
all of this wickedness you've tried to bring about, everything you've tried to do, you fooled yourself into thinking it's just an isolated thing. In my four years or my eight years, I'll just go on out. It won't happen in my lifetime. Everybody always tried to put the return of the Lord off in their grandchildren's lifetime, my whole life. Well, I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime. That's because you're not wanting it to happen in your lifetime. And you push it off to your children's lifetimes and your grandchildren's lifetime. And you think politicians, well, I can make these wicked decisions. People will soon forget about it. But God won't forget. You have sown a seed the earth will remember. And on your deathbed, when you're laying there, about to go wide-eyed and face God himself, you will call for mercy. And the God of mercy will give mercy. But you will not be given back the time. You can't fix it. You have unleashed a monster on the world. And you did it. And it's recorded in the Chronicles. The hunter, the Lord said to me this morning, is about to become the hunted. These who act like lions stalking and attacking like lions, are about to meet real lions. The lion of the tribe of Judah has raised a pride of lions of his own. They are now on the prowl to bring people into the kingdom and now will be aggressive and will go head to head and against the world. They will go head to head against this, all of this evil, all of the wickedness and all of the, uh, against the face or the force of this evil. And the evil people, politicians, will, scram, will scream as the lions go head to head. To, listen to this. As the lions go head to head, those who are acting like it, the real pride, will go head to head. And wicked politicians will scream as the lions go head to head to see who will sire the next generation. Now, I don't know if you heard that. Satan walks about as a roaring lion. Jesus is a roaring lion. He's raised up his own pride. And the two are about to meet. And politicians will scream as these two forces meet and fight to see who gets the right to sire the coming generation. I want you to hear this and remember this as I close now. The, the mysterious is the journey of the prophetic. Mysteries do not come from unexpected moments. Those can be attacks from the enemy, from open doors that went unnoticed. Mysteries come so mis, the mysterious in a, in a prophet's life or in the prophetic life comes from the journey because you see the great picture and then you walk toward the picture and the mysterious is getting to the picture. Remember Abraham was told, he said he went out to a land to find a land that God had showed him of. So the mysteries, and you say, well, this unexpected thing happened. It must be the plan of God. It's a mystery. No, no. Most of those are attacks that came from doors that were cracked open that you left unnoticed. You didn't notice they were open. But the mysteries in the prophetic life comes from walking toward the big picture that God has showed you. Mysteries of a prophet are from the journey. He or she is called upon to take. 
a journey embarked upon to find the complete picture you saw before you started. The journey toward that finished puzzle is where the mysteries are. Abraham went out on a journey and a mystery in search of a land that God had told him of. He saw the place afar off three days and three nights later, and he was there in the future on that mountain that he rendezvoused with his mysteries and his big picture. Now, my brother and sister, everything I told you today, you may not understand exactly. Because you say, well, how do you say that, Brother Robin? Because I don't understand them all exactly. But you do see the big picture and the war, the prophetic warfare that has come. And you and I must stand and resist in this day. If China's precious people, I said it right, precious people, who heard the scream of freedom in their DNA, stepped up to the plate and called out Xi in different provinces when any other time in history they would have been slaughtered like animals. And yet they would stand and call for freedom. If that's happening around the world, then a resistance has been mounted. And we must stand. And if they can do that in China, our brothers and sisters there, could how much less should we do in the, in the land of the free and the home of the brave? We must stand. We must be a real lion in these days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, it's the time of the lion. You see it on my guitar. But this morning, the Lord has sent word that the eagle is flying again. So it's the eagle and the lion. The eagle and the lion. It's flying again. The eagle and the lion. The eagle sees and the lion roars and fights and I'm going to tell you something. Nothing dominates the sky like an eagle. And nothing dominates the ground like a lion. And so here we are. And you have to decide what you are today. Are you part of this camp, the lion camp, or, or the stream, we should say? Or are you just fishing with artificial bait? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord God, for the people that are watching. Thank you, Lord. Let the truths and the, and, and the, the words and the power that was said from your word sink deep in their hearts and it grow up and become greater than any problem they face. Lord God, I ask you in the name of Jesus to woo the hearts of those who have never made you the Lord of their life. And woo the hearts of those, Lord, who are standing, Lord God, that are backslidden, but they need to be back in the fold. Woo their hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Krista, come on up here and give the people opportunity to receive Jesus as Lord. I was going to do it, and the Lord said, let Krista... Give them that opportunity before you receive our offering today. That's the number one thing of all things. But why should we settle for just one thing? We should have victory in every area of our life. First thing is first, make Jesus the Lord of your life. Then start standing on the promises of the living God. And get it all. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, Jesus died on the cross. He did. And you know what? I'm still preaching that message today. He did. That's a true story. You know, we've got all these shirts going around at this time of year that says true story on them. And it's got the nativity scene. That really did happen. Then he grew up. 
and he paid the ultimate price, and that's a true story. The pictures that you see of him hanging on the cross, that's a true story. It's just the picture doesn't do it justice. It just doesn't do it justice, and we'll never know, I don't think, this side of heaven, exactly what that day looked like. But one day we will know. But to get there to see it, you've got to first accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior because the Scripture says that he is the only way there's nobody else you're not getting to heaven any other way except through jesus and his blood and that's what i believe that is what i have always believed that is my heart that is the absolute i mean that's the core of my being who i am is that jesus he he came into this world as the lamb of god the sinless spotless lamb of god and then he grew up and he did miraculous things that's recorded in the scripture he healed the sick he raised the dead and then he went and took all of it upon himself and he was raised from the dead and he's alive forevermore and he's coming back for you and I and I want to see you there with me amen and so I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that and I'm going to tell you exactly what the scripture says to do it makes it so simple that even a child can do it even a child, that's, that's exact why, because he, he views us as his children. And so he wants us to be able to do it, and it's this simple. All you have to do is confess with your mouth. So you just say, Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And just to add something with it, you say, take my life and do something with it. And my friends, if you said that prayer today, then you just became a child of God. And if we never meet each other this side of heaven, we've got the rest of forever <laughs> to meet each other. Amen. And we'll know each other when we see each other. Amen. Praise God. Well, I want to give you the opportunity to, to sow your seed today. I want to give you the opportunity to sow in in faith today, in obedience and expectation. Because we're obedience, we're obedient to what God is telling us to sow, but then where the expectation comes in is where he said what will happen when you do give. And then we expect that to come to pass because God is not a man that he should lie and his word is true. So if he said it, he means for it to happen. And so as you're getting ready to give today, as you're, you're getting online, the ways to give are on the screen. If you want to, to sew by mailing a check, everything is made out online. And you can also find all of this information at robindbullock.com. You know, some people... Some people are wondering about my sweatshirt today, you know, about I, I really do like Snoopy. I've always liked Snoopy. I've always liked Charlie Brown. And, you know, uh, Charles Schultz was a Christian. And he told in a Charlie Brown Christmas, he told the actual Christmas story because Charlie Brown was crying out. He was saying, can somebody tell me what Christmas means? What the real meaning of Christmas is? And Linus comes up to him and he says, I can tell you the real meaning of Christmas, Charlie Brown. And I can hear his voice. And he begins to, to tell, he begins to quote Luke, the book of Luke. He even drops his blanket, which is a very, very rare occasion. He drops it, and you, you could just see it, really, the anointing came on him, and he did, the preach came on him, and he dropped that blanket, and he said, fear not, fear not. So, but number one, that's what I've come to tell you today, fear not. Fear not about your finances. I'm dropping my blanket. That's the mic drop. I'm dropping my blanket. Fear not. Get your thumb out your mouth. Drop your blanket and fear not and begin to proclaim the word of the Lord and his promises. And, you know, I'm wearing this. I have a Charlie Brown sweatshirt also that has the whole Peanuts gang on it. I've got a matching sweatsuit that's got it. I, I really do. I like the Peanuts. But Snoopy... You see this? You see this guy right here? 
Joe Cool in Woodstock with his, with his Santa hat and his scarf and his glasses. Snoopy did what he wanted to do. He did not follow what everybody else was doing. Snoopy went against the grain. He did. I mean, he said, I don't want Charlie Brown on this shirt. This is me. He decorated his house when nobody else would decorate it. He did when Snoopy got something in him. He did it. And he went against, he had, I mean, you were, if there was ever a dog that was really rich, I believe it was Snoopy because he did everything. He could fly a plane. <laughs> he could do all kinds of stuff. But that's what I've been wanting to tell you today ever since I was on the drums. Number one, fear not. And let's quote the word and believe what it says is coming to pass. But go against the grain what the world is doing today. You put your Santa hat and your scarf and your sunglasses on and you start walking in the direction that God wants you to walk in and you will watch people begin to follow you. You will, you will begin to watch people go with you. Be different. You know, and when they say this is different, you say one of my favorite quotes, get used to different. Get Snoopy was different before anybody else was different. And so today, if you're a tither, if you're a giver, you're already different. You're already going against what the world wants. And I'm telling you, my brother and sister, you are about to start seeing people turn and follow you. And then you can tell them, fear not. Fear not when they say, can somebody tell me what the real meaning of this is? You say, I can. Can somebody tell me how to prosper? I can. Can somebody tell me how to not spend my holidays during cold and flu season sick? I can. I can. Fear not what the world is saying and be different. Get used to different. Amen. Amen. Well, Luke 638, speaking of the book, uh, the book of Luke, that's a good book. It's just a really good book. It says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it. I receive it. I call it done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're a tither, you are already different. You know what? I'm different right now. I'm different. This is different. This is called, see, before I cut it on, that's the offering. There's the offering and the tithe <laughs> together. Whoa. Blanket drop. Malachi 3.10. Bringing all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done, in Jesus' name, amen, so be it. Now, rejoicing with Roxanne. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear everybody laughing. <laughs> That was amazing. <laughs> There's your Christmas offering message right there. <laughs> it's time to rejoice with everybody around the world with your praise reports that you sent in. You know, the Lord spoke to me when I was sitting there. I was reading over some of these, and let me see if I can say this right. He said, when you are testifying of what God has done in your life, you are actively rehearsing the physical manifestation of the working word in your life that's what he said and i said you know what we should make the devil's ears bleed with how many times a day we rejoice over what god's doing for us it doesn't matter if he's healed the hangnail you testify that he healed your hangnail so hallelujah we had uh, quite a few come in this week um we have a partner that said 
They wrote in last week asking for prayer that the Lord would open a door for employment. Monday of this past week, I went for an interview and I got the job that was very close to my home with great pay. And the man that interviewed me is a born again Christian. So I'm so grateful to God. He truly answered my prayer and thank you and God bless. So thank you, Lord, that you are giving jobs to those in need. Hallelujah. When you're in desperate need of a job and the Lord blesses you, you'll go running across the room. Hallelujah. And we will run with you. Um, this is a precious partner that wrote in and said, this is a praise report. God is absolutely good. I've been a tither to your ministry since 2020. I needed some money to get three birthday gifts and 10 Christmas gifts for my grandkids. I asked God to supply this need, and I needed a breakthrough that week. I watched the 11th hour and became determined for the walls to fall and victory to burst out. I listened to an angel song about holy, holy, king of glory. Jesus is the one we call the true almighty God. All week, walking uh, around the walls, shouting this, the devil tried to attack me with my back to the point where I couldn't move or sit or barely walk. But I said, this is not going to stop me from worshiping for my breakthrough. Today, my back is healed, and I received $350 for Christmas, totally unexpected. All I could do was shout, thank you, God. You are absolutely good. So hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I read this praise report, and... And I started just to cry reading it because it was so just so precious to me. Hearing about widows being blessed like really touches my heart when I hear about this. Um, I'm really tender to that. And a precious lady, she wrote in and she said, I watched the 11th hour and have rejoiced with fellow believers' praise reports. Now it's my turn. I'm a widow of three years having cared for my husband for six years before he passed. The last nine years have been very difficult for me and my four children. Last week, I tithed on a portion of my income to the ministry and reminded God that he looks after the widows and the fatherless. The next day, a deposit was made into my account for 20 times the amount I tithed. I thought the retirement agency had made a mistake because the account IDs didn't match mine. Today, I got a letter from the agency stating they'd reviewed my late husband's benefits and I was entitled to the money they deposited. Plus, they were upwardly adjusting my monthly benefits starting this December. So praise God for his word. It's always true. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands and shout wherever you're at and rejoice with everyone for what God is doing. We thank you, Father, for what you are doing in the earth right now. We rejoice. Hallelujah. Send your praise reports to robindbullock.com. Write in, call in, let us know how the Lord has blessed you. Hallelujah. Man, that is awesome. Awesome. I mean, isn't that awesome? 20 times. That's amazing. You know, Krista uh, told everybody how to be born again and, and receive Jesus as Lord. You know, I want to tell you how to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Baptism in the Holy Ghost is, man, you're talking about fire. That's also uh those lights that come on, man, that's baptism in the Holy Ghost. And what you want to do is you want to say, you know, it's the same Holy Ghost that saved you, the Spirit of God that lives in you, but now he's going to come up on you. And when he comes up on you, he anoints you for service and power. He brings that bootstrapping power. And what that means is, is bootstrapping power is an old term that was attributed, I, I guess, to a dynamo type thing where the faster it turns, the more power it cranks out. The more power it cranks out, the faster it turns. And it just keeps feeding on itself like that and just keeps getting bigger and bigger until it's, it gets into bootstrapping. And it's where a man gets strong enough to reach down and take his own bootstraps and pick himself up off the ground. That's amazing. Only God can do that. that that'd be called walking on water, wouldn't it? And so the Lord wants you to receive the Holy Ghost as, as your baptizer. When you got saved, Holy Ghost baptized you in Jesus. But when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, the Savior baptizes you in fire. You just simply say, just like the upper room that day, you just simply say, Lord Jesus, 
Baptize me in the mighty Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit tells me what to say. As the Spirit gives me the utterance. And just start saying, now, thank you, Lord, for baptizing me in the Holy Ghost. And I'm just going to praise you for it. And just start praising him. And then with these sounds you hear, whatever they may be, that's utterance from God. Start saying it out loud. And that's real. Just like the guy went into that bar that night. Suddenly, he's speaking in tongues. He don't know what to do about that. Well, that's how real it is. Amen. And when you don't know the answer, you can pray in other tongues. You can pray those utterances, and you can hear. You can hear what to do. Amen. Maybe one day on the 11th hour, the Lord will let me teach on just being baptized in the Spirit and speaking in tongues. Amen. Well, it's been good to be with you today. It's been a great 11th hour. It's been a, a great 11th hour today, hasn't it? Amen. New song, new music, words, uh, messages. We saw Snoopy in a light-up shirt, and the Lord equated that to his power. And that You know, that's just getting where you live, isn't it? That's just coming right there where you live so that you, he can get that point across. Amen. Well, until next time, we gather together right here around God's Word. I want you to remember, never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom. Mm -hmm.